Hello and welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Today we're going to be talking uh, with a very good friend of mine. This is Tom Richards from Nicholson Construction Company. We're going to be talking about his career as a geotechnical engineer. We're we'll talking about some of the things that he's done throughout the industry, especially as it relates to his involvement with technical committees and technical initiatives for professional organizations for geotechnical engineers. We're also going to spend some time talking about working platforms, what they are are, how they're constructed, how they're designed, some of the available resources for those that want to know more and incorporate these into your projects. We're also going to talk about working platforms mean for those in the field and for those that are designing. So a lot to unpack here. Uh, looking forward to this conversation for some time now, and I trust that you'll find value in some of the things we're going to be talking about here. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. But before we get started, we're going to hear a word from our sponsor for today's episode, that being PPI, a Kaplan company. And with that, let's dive right into today's episode. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Tom, how are you doing? Great. How about you, Jared? I'm good. I'm good. I'm 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 so happy that you found time to carve out for us. I know that you're busy. I know that you got a lot going on, but I'm so glad to see you. I, I know that uh, in my career, early in my career, I remember having conversations with you. So to have it recorded here this should be a lot of fun <laughs> yeah we first met at a dfi thing in new york city probably around the year 2000 oh my goodness you got a better memory than me yeah you're right you're right i was scared to death in that room i was the young guy <laughs> with, all, <laughs> yeah. with all these legends around me man that was that was scary <laughs> that was scary well tom it would be great if you could uh, kind of set the stage, tell us a little bit more about you, but I would love it if you did it in the way of talking about some key milestones and experiences that have helped shape you as a geotechnical engineer. And if you want to talk about some standout projects and accomplishments, you could do that as well. And I don't know if I've ever said it, but you've definitely been one of those engineers in the field that I've looked up to. So uh, I'm, well, thank I'm looking you. forward to this conversation. So if you could do that for us, that'd be great. So I, I graduated from University of Pittsburgh with a bachelor's degree and, and went to work for a geotech consultant here in Pittsburgh called GAI Consultants. And it was a great training ground. When I, and I had the plan that I was going to do that for three years and then do something else. But I didn't really know what that was. But it was great. I got to do site investigation, slope stability analysis, geotech reports, all that stuff. And then when the three years was approaching, I met Donald Bruce at a uh, local meeting and said, wow, he's the guy who wrote that rock anchor manual. I'd also tested rock anchors when I was at GAI and thought that was real fun and said, wow, I think maybe Nicholson's the next thing I should do. So I went there in 1988 and was there for 30 and a half years and <laughs> retired early. Um so my wife and I could enjoy life while we still had the uh, physical abilities. Uh, during the Nicholson days, there was all kinds of jobs of a lifetime. Um, probably the first big one was working on stuff on the central artery tunnel. Uh, we did a test program and we did a bunch of retaining walls and anchors clay anchors with pretty high loads and that was fun investigating that stuff and uh undrained shear strengths of clay uh investigation that was fun and then the next bigger one was uh williamsburg bridge in new york city where we put in a whole bunch of micro piles and did 30 pile load tests and that's where i really did most of the pile load tests yeah. i had done them before that too 
Um, <clears throat> and probably the next biggest one was Mandalay Bay in Vegas, where we went in and drilled micro piles deeper than any borings had gone. And there's a whole, <laughs> there's recordings out there of that whole experience that was... <laughs> That was definitely a project of a lifetime, and I, I've openly said it in all those presentations. It was we were going beyond what we knew, yeah, because, because we didn't really know what the problem was, and so every night I prayed for safety for wow. us and for the guys in, working in the hotel. It was a, wow. you know, there was thousands of people working in the hotel, building it. Yeah. Um. And then I guess I just kind of got into other stuff. Nothing stands out as being a project of a lifetime since then. Okay. Got to do more jet grouting later in my career. That was fun. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, you, you know, when you think about what it means to be a geotech and, and to have several decades under your belt or whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of stripes, you know, and you start talking about things that you've load tested. And I know that you've, You've you've written several papers. You've presented. That's why folks like me know you, and and you've 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 learned a lot. But I think that you've also shared a lot, and I want to say I appreciate that. I really do appreciate that because uh, I think that that I mean we learn a lot in our textbooks. We learn a lot when we're in school. We're getting a degree, but I think that there's something to be said about when we're sharing our experiences, the ups and the downs, and what we learn. In the case histories, it does help. The, the overall practice. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> uh, I, I like load testing things the most because you have a prediction of what's going to happen and it, you get to see how it did. And then you think about what caused that to be like that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I always like taking things to failure when we're doing a load test, yeah. preferably beyond the contract requirement to get paid. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, that's, that's when we truly learn. That's when we truly learn. So let's see, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about something very important to, to, to both of us and the industry as a whole, but can you explain what working platforms are? And in the context of geotechnical engineering, why are they crucial for various construction projects? So working platforms are the, the name that we uh, that got assigned to the platform you work the, the equipment on. And frequently it's a, it's a layer of gravel on top of poor subgrade. There's lots of jobs where there's decent subgrade and you don't need anything. Um, and there's jobs where you're on a concrete pavement and that helps. And if you put crane mats down, that can help. But the crane mats have a cost associated with them moving them around and so the idea is to come up with something that provides a safe working environment and it gets motivated by the fact that we see way too many overturned rigs um, i did a presentation that is on the dfi website or there's a link on the dfi website that showed a whole bunch of overturned rigs and it's, it's scary to watch it happen. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it personally witnessed it, but uh, to me, my motivation for this being an important topic is that the guys operating those drill rigs are my friends. Yep. Um, and, and then the geotech guys on the job, the inspectors become friends with those guys too. And for any of them, including anyone on the site, to get hurt by a rig falling over, or worse yet, killed, and I only know one that was a death, but it doesn't matter. It, it, there's a risk there. And so we want to reduce that risk and give our guys more support than just saying, hey, we need to make sure this is a good working platform. Yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's serious. We... we um... You know, I don't think I, it was when I first started working because I, you hear about construction, but you don't really appreciate, I didn't grow up in a family that was like construction workers, right? So I didn't really know about construction until I got to construction sites. And I said, man, it's, this is right? it's scary stuff what we're, what we're around and what we're next to. And I remember the first time being on a project where there was a drill rig, it 
there was so much emphasis on, you know, where to stand and, and where to be out of harm's way. And it's, 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 it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And I did, I have had a tragic uh, loss from, from a former employee and it was due to an overturning rig. So, you know, wow. the work that's being done with, with working platforms, this is, this is serious, serious, serious stuff. So, so I guess well, another one. That's not the one I, I mentioned. And yeah, I know. In, I, no, it's totally, unless you were totally in Toronto. Um, no, nope, this is a totally different one in, in the U S and um, it's, it, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal. So I was talking to Scott Jacobs a little while ago and I was saying that, you know, this working platform initiative, this is something that's, that's going to change the industry and it takes all of us. So let's see, when you're thinking about your career, and you think about examples of projects where using working platforms made a significant difference to project safety. What are the kind of things that, that, that come into play there? Well, a lot of my early career, I was working with smaller rigs <laughs> and, and they don't put near the stress on the ground. And so other things like, um, concrete slabs that are in there or just temporary cohesion from surface tension can easily make those stable and they're just the center of gravity is not so high that that when it falls over it's not that big a deal and i've i've never been on a job where a rig fell over but i've but we also frequently put crane mats down on on big equipment like a big hydrophrase I can't remember what we did for sure in Boston with the uh, central artery and the soil mixing equipment. Those were, those were big, big rigs. Um, I think it was the combination of the granular fill that already existed over most of the Boston that provided stability. And there was often uh, pavements and all concrete slabs already there. Got it. So I've never actually been on one that overturned, but what motivated this for me was we started getting these bigger and bigger rigs um, and getting into bigger foundation elements. And when we looked at them, we just said, wow, these things are big. And we saw all these other images of them being overturned. And so we we started to study it and um, and at least talk about it more, try to put more analytics behind it. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. You have, you know, you, you typically don't have a rig involved on a project that has shallow bedrock and good soil. You typically have a rig yeah. on a site because you have to advance through all the crap to get to the good stuff. And so you have this big, heavy piece of machinery that comes to install something in the ground and it's sitting on soil that's not great. And it, they just keep getting bigger and heavier. Mm -hmm. You know, Bauer keeps coming up with a new, you know, <laughs> 48, 50, who knows what's next? They're, <laughs> they just keep getting bigger. Yeah. So your experience, I mean, what are, what are some of the common challenges? We kind of hinted at this, but what are some of the common challenges and, and misconceptions that geotechs have when designing and implementing effective working platforms for drill rigs, for cranes, and these other large pieces of equipment? Um, I don't know that, it, that they have misconceptions. They just, I, I, I would request that they make it more, educate the owner that when we're recommending a six foot shaft or a big auger cast, that it's going to be a big rig coming in there mm -hmm. and that somebody needs to deal with this subject. Yeah. and allocate a budget, maybe even a bid line item to, to cover it, because otherwise that's a lump sum cost that has to get bid somewhere in the bid documents. Um, what I've found in trying to do the calculations is we always end up with more gravel than we thought we would have needed. Yeah. And and that's a, that's it's almost like a a defined outcome, right? If 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 our thoughts were always really good, then rigs wouldn't have been falling over. Yeah. So if you start trying to put some math to it, then you end up with more more frequent sites that need gravel and more thickness of gravel than what you thought might have worked. And that's a challenge because you know everybody remembers that other job. Hey, we didn't need to do anything. Now you're saying we need to do something, but 
you just have to accept that that's going to happen because we want to improve the safety. The other thing in in doing the trying to work through the calculations is you realize that there's some other things going on that make things work better than what our ability to predict is. Mm. Um, and I think the main thing is apparent surface tension of water. Mm. Um, you know, I, I've tried to run numbers. Anytime I see a, a, a rig at a beach, mm -hmm. uh, it's just surprising to me that that works and <laughs> it's got to be surface tension of water. It works. I've even have images. I think they were of excavators sitting in water so you would think that all the surface tensions dissipated by the water but it could be that as they're working they're causing dilation for the short term that mm -hmm. makes surface tension work i didn't try to calculate those were only hydraulic excavators i didn't try to calculate that image i didn't have enough information to do it yeah but i just have a sense that it'd be hard for those numbers to work out yeah but it's yeah. okay look we're we're going to need more gravel, but then we're going to reduce the risk to everybody on the job site. Yeah, that makes sense. And and, and I guess that there's a, you know, there's a, there, there's a cost, but there's also a logistics aspect, right? Like if you're bringing material on the site that then after you've finished the working, you the working platform, you've done all your piles or you've done all your ground improvement, and now you're ready to leave the site. Now you have to strip that out or, or regrade I mean, potentially like or you you just work your grading so that it's there's some beneficial use to it after the fact like yeah. the guys doing uh ground improvement um cmcs they're yeah. our friends okay. <laughs> uh, they already want to load transfer platform so put it in first yeah. and then and then get the benefit out of it making the site safer while you're installing the cmcs yeah. Or rigid inclusion. Sense. Sorry, that I should have used the more yeah. generic. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Okay. And and, and uh, you know, I again I, I knew you because of projects you worked on, but but also I've I've seen all that you've done in industry committees such as DFI, uh ADSC, uh, uh, I believe you're doing stuff with PTI. And these are leading industry committees that have led to leading industry documents. So can you talk a little bit more about your involvement in these committees and, and how that has influenced for the development of these guidelines and best practices for working platforms? Well, I, I've always liked the committees um, because it, it brings forward technical challenges and maybe they're challenges I, I saw and I brought to the committee or they're challenges other people saw. Mm -hmm. Um from my memory, the first time I mentioned working platforms was at an ADSC meeting in about 2005. I asked the safety committee if they were frustrated arguing with their GCs about the site conditions uh, when they got there. So it takes a while to get stuff done, <laughs> but that's just human nature. It takes a while to create change. That was like <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, it took it took a while for, pe for people to really get on board with at least talking about the subject. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all kinds of different things. And it, the other thing is, you know, I'm a, I'm a nerdy person. And I, so I want people to, to think of things with uh, technical respect and and I'm trying in some ways trying to influence people to think like me in these uh, committee documents. I also like just the banter at going to a committee meeting and talking about something and giving somebody a hard time. It's just kind of <laughs> fun. I, I'm going to DFI next week to and I'll hang out at a bunch of committee meetings and Cause some Probably trouble. Poke some fun. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it, it's right. I think one of the things that's so interesting to me, or it has been interesting and, and still is interesting that, you know, you go to a committee meeting and you're with colleagues, but you're also with the people that you're bidding against, or you're, you're with your competition, so to say. But the reality is that we're working together to make the industry better. So some yep. of the things that may have frustrated, you know, XYZ company, yeah, that's a pain point for you as well. And it's like, all right, well, what can we do to make this better? And when I think about the working platforms, right? If if, if I'm the geotechnical consultant and I've recommended this 
Let's make it up five foot diameter shaft. And I've said nothing about a working platform. I've given you specs or bid documents. I've said nothing about a working platform. Now you're bidding the job. GC knows nothing about it. CM knows nothing about it. Owner knows nothing about it. And you say, oh, by the way, I need a working platform. It's going to take this many days or weeks to finish. And it's going to cost this much. And it's going to be, I don't want to pay for that. I don't know what that is, right? If I'm the owner. So there, there's definitely an education that has to happen. You're working on that. What resources are out there or, or forthcoming? Or, I mean, where, where should folks that are listening to this podcast and want to do the right thing, where, where should they be going to, to do the right thing? So on the DFI website, there's a web page for the, uh, the task force that's dealing with working platforms. And it's a joint task force between DFI, ADSC, PDCA, and ASCE, I think st still participating. And, and <clears throat> uh, there's just a lot of links on that page to documents are available. There's already a publication that's a joint between EFFC, that's the European Foundation Contractors Federation. I said those letters backwards. Okay. Between it's a it's a joint document between them and DFI. So that's the first cut. There's uh, there's some there's a D ADSC DFI document that kind of says here's the site conditions where you really should do some analysis about the working platform, define a cohesion, define a, a shear strength, and define a total rig weight that say, hey, this is big. You need to do some analysis, or you should do some analysis. Um, so that that's a great website. And then there's an within DFI, there's another task force that's working with EFFC on a couple research studies. Okay. So I, hopefully we can post the two. Yeah, links. we'll get those. Yep, we'll get those links in the show notes so people can 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 go right there. That's that's excellent. That's excellent. And yes, and, and there the, the the main resources. There's a spreadsheet. It's called the Federation of Piling Specialists Spreadsheet (FPS) spreadsheet. That uh, you have to email them now to to get the newest version. Okay. Um, but having worked with it some. I really think that's more of the specialist contractors realm to figure out what what forces is he going to use and and what equipment is he going to use to to and get all the details pieced together about that equipment. Um, okay. It's going to be really hard for a geotech engineer to dig all that stuff out. Yeah. Uh, the best resource for the information is the owner's manual of the rig. Okay. And, and then, then there's and then, also and then the there's also the consultant also doesn't know what rig you're going to bring out there, so it's like right. it's it's more appropriate, right? Okay. And, but along those lines, the the current research, one of the research things that uh, EFFC DFI are doing, is trying to put together at least the first cut of pressures you would expect from a given size rig doing a given technology. Okay. Um. So, so it at least gets you in a ballpark of what the pressures are. And they're, they're big pressures. I mean, 10 KSF is not unusual. It's a pressure wow. that's applied on the effective area of the tracks. Wow. Wow. So um, is, is, is there something that the consultant needs to be doing? So like the geotech, something I need to, do I need to be doing CPTs in lieu of borings? I mean, there's something we need to do in addition to what we would do for the typical building to get our foundation recommendations. Well, I would encourage you just, just like, if you're dealing with piles with lateral load, I would encourage you to not just blow through the top 10 feet with the, uh, with probing <laughs> it with it, like a uh, yeah. back vacuing out the top 10 feet for passing utilities. I mean, I get there's, there's a challenge there, but we yeah. also need information on yep. the parameters, the behavior of the ground right at subgrade. Mm -hmm. So try include in your investigation, something about that, surface or if you can't get to it because of utilities and stuff then say hey this should be investigated when subgrades prepared and utilities are cleared and disconnected and so at least address that something needs to be done to pay attention to the working grade that, that we're all building from very good point very good point and men just mention the fact that this is a topic 
that the owner and the contractors should should deal with. Okay. This is good. This is good. Now, what do you think of what do you think is the the most challenging aspect of use like utilizing a working platform effectively? And what's the right way to get over over, over those challenges? Sounds like some of it is just talking about it. But let's say let's say we know it's going to happen. We've a kept perfect world. We've accounted for it. Are there still some challenges for getting the right parameters or getting the right analysis? I, what are your thoughts I, there? Our biggest challenge is first we're gonna we're gonna end up putting gravel or geotextiles or crane mats on sites that we say, man, it doesn't feel like we had to do this before. We wouldn't have put this much on this site. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, that's just that's an outcome of improving the safety and the reducing the risk. Mm -hmm. The second part is we still like for these big rigs, we still using traditional geotechnical bearing capacity things. We end up with gravel thicknesses that just feel you know, if you could come up with four or five foot gravel thicknesses, it, it just feels like way too much. And so we know from experience that that's not what it necessarily takes to even make it safer. So the challenge is dealing with, in my opinion, it's mostly below the tracks, dealing with the geotechnics. And this is all short-term loading type stuff. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about how is the parent surface tension, the parent cohesion from surface tension going to make this better? And how can I lose it? And um, that that's a challenge for uh, our community. And it's part of what's being researched uh, in the current EFFC DFI studies. Got it. Got it. And um, what's another thing I was thinking about? Once the working platform is constructed, it then has to be modified if you're drilling through it or drilling alongside it. Like, how does that? It has to work? be maintained. Like, spoils need to be cleared away. You need to be a little more vigilant about letting the spoils uh, fill up the pores. Mm -hmm. um, but even if, well, that affects what happens when it rains in the future. Even if they do, the, the stresses are already in the gravel. Right. They're already touched. The contacts are already touching. But you, you need to maintain it, not let the uh, – and, and keep the water draining away on the site. Got it. Um, which are all good, regular site uh, maintenance topics um, that should be done in the first place anyway, even yeah. without the gravel. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Now, one thing that um, I, I think is important for a successful project, and I've definitely seen this when you and I have worked on projects together, just the importance of communication for different team members, right? So geotechnical engineers uh, that are the design professional that's that's the engineer of record on the consulting side is working with the engineer that's on the construction side, especially contractor. And effective communication is important to have real collaboration between these folks. And then you also have this other layer of the, the the folks that are doing the work, the crane operators, the drill rig operators, our friends, your friends, as you said earlier. And, and you want to do this so that we're safe, so that we're efficient. How much more important is it as it relates to these working platforms, especially considering the working platforms, although you mentioned it 20 years ago, it's still kind of a new thing in this modern geotechnical world. I mean, how, how much more important is that collaboration as in compared to any other project? I think the topic's more important because of the size of things we are doing. We're all going to bigger foundations, bigger equipment. Equipment can, they can do it in one pass. It makes the mast really, really tall. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it, as an industry, we're advancing our technology and we've got to realize that that influences how things, what it takes to build them and to, to have the, the safety on the site. Got it. Got it. All right, cool. So if you pull out your crystal ball and you, you look ahead, 
what is the future? What are, what are future working platforms and what does this look like when we think about the future for geotechnical engineering design as it relates to working platforms? And then also, are there any emerging technologies or, or trends that you think are going to have a significant impact in the design and in the usage? Well, I, I hope that the future is that we do some analysis to understand that how much we are applying load to this to the ground at the shallow ground, and that we, in the in the process of uh, designing and talking about the work platform, we commit to making things, to proving our assumptions of design. So, some emerging technologies. There are uh, dynamic cone penetrometers that are being studied. Uh, the other one's called a lightweight deflectometer. So these are like almost handheld devices uh, that that you use to prove the subgrade. And then uh, plate load tests, uh, even in my presentation that's online, I was against plate load tests because I didn't feel it tested the subgrade. But a guy from uh, the Europe convinced me that, look, the plate load test can still verify the working platform material, right? It's hard to do grain size or it's hard to do direct shear tests when you got uh, two inch aggregates. Mm -hmm. But but if you can do a plate load test and then back out what that means in terms of what your uh, friction angle is, then that can validate that part of the design. Okay. So there's Excellent. a lot of validation opportunities. Um, just just paying attention to the subgrade before you put the gravel on, testing it for its performance and density. So I hope that we just start paying attention in the short term that we start paying attention to it. And in the long term, come up with a, a good way to analyze it that considers all these things that really make it work. Got it. Got it. I'm thinking about your... Your, your load testing, right? I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for research. You said folks doing research now. Hopefully we fast forward and this is something that's taught in the class, something that lives in the textbook, right? Or it's a chapter on working platforms, right? I mean, why not, right? Why not? That'd be cool. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting because it's it's traditional bearing capacity stuff. Yeah. And and really um it's it's a lot about the the, the basic capacity equations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of interesting analysis. Right. A big lesson I learned was that if you don't have embedment on a frictional material, your bearing capacity is really poor. Yeah. So anytime <laughs> you just have uh, C equals zero at the surface, it's very tough to make the calculations work. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And, and most of those textbook examples, you have the, the footings embedded, right? So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you have that factor. All right, cool. Well, let's go back. This feels like it was a long time ago, but it was only two years ago. You you received a Distinguished Service Award from DFI, Deep Foundation Institute, and you were the 2021 DFI Traveling Lecture. Congratulations for both of those. Can you share some highlights or key takeaways from your travels and your interactions with professionals and friends uh, throughout the geotechnical community from those experiences? Well, the first thing you mentioned was the award. The award was uh, extremely humbling. Uh, my my coworkers at Nicholson submitted it, and uh, and the, the committee bought it. Um, <laughs> uh, and it was fun to get it. It was. I still. Uh, that's it right there, right there. Oh, the that's award. cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I I'm still. Uh, I say to myself, "Wow, it's just shocking that I got it because uh, there's." You look at the other names and the other the names that, that haven't got it yet were that were my colleagues in, in the DFI activities. Um <clears throat> so that was just a great uh, time in Chicago uh, in 2019. 2019. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was four years ago. Wow. <laughs> um <clears throat> and then a year or two later I was doing a traveling lecture. The best part about the traveling lecture was just meeting people in in different areas of the country and uh, the california uh 
one of the recordings that's out the recording that's out there on the dfi website is a talk i did in california okay. and it was on work platforms and it was interesting because i'd worked occasionally in california but not much but they really uh seemed to like it and then they had me do a couple other uh webinars after that okay. so it was fun to, to interact with them and uh, and be at lake tahoe <laughs> um <clears throat> But just meeting meeting different people in the different locations, it was still on the verge of uh, COVID issues. So I did a lot of them by webinar, which was extremely efficient from um, both a DFI budget standpoint and and for the, the uh, audience too. So that was fun. The, the most fun was the most requested presentation was about mandalay bay and that was just a good um just a great story to tell it's a fun story to tell but there were still some technical lessons to be learned well it's good because you're such a good storyteller that's why <laughs> <laughs> all right great well before we take our break tom uh what's in a piece of advice you would give to aspiring geotechnical engineers especially those that are eager to contribute to the field and make a positive impact, and especially those that want to do something related to working platforms to keep folks safe around drill rigs and cranes. What piece of advice you give for them? I think the first piece is find something that you really enjoy, almost love in, in what you're doing. I, I love doing pile load tests, so you know I, I went out on a lot of them. Um, and it, if you really think about it and you aren't enjoying geotechnical engineering then maybe consider something else sure. but you really should find something you enjoy the second thing is to get involved with the industry committees um you know you interact with people who are potentially uh competitors but a lot of the guys a lot of the people who would be uh either in my case they were clients the engineering clients or they or if you're an engineer, you meet the contractors and realize that maybe we're not a, just a bunch of uh, <laughs> cash hungry people. <laughs> um, so get involved with the committees. And then once you're involved with them and once you're going to association things, go up and talk to people, talk to the old guys and find out what stories we have or what lesson we learned. Um we, we we have information to share. Love it. I love it. That's a good note to pause on. So thank you so much. We're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out with Tom and our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. All right. Welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your actual career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Tom Richards of the Nicholson Construction Company. Tom, you've had a very successful career. And when you look back in your career, what's something that you've implemented in your career to give yourself, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? I, I feel like some of this was my answer to the last question, but I think to, to reiterate, first, I'm do, I did something I really enjoyed and you, you gotta be, you gotta enjoy what you're doing or it just gets stale and you're just going through the motions. And the second thing is with the committee stuff, um, it, it leads to opportunities to, uh, speak at conferences, uh, to review documents, um, with other people, and and network with other people and all that helps build your credibility and your relationships um and so it's not about be i guess i'm not saying be safe i'm saying go <laughs> ahead out there and 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 try things and and meet people uh don't be afraid to talk to them uh, and and event and and all those things you just keep making the right decisions about enjoying work uh giving back to the to the industry and it just keeps building and building uh what ends up being a career i love it i love it that was great 
Tom, thank you so much for coming on and for sharing all the great insights. You shared some information and advice that I know is going to be helpful for our listeners and those that are watching. Somebody wants to find you. What's the best way for them to find you in your social media? You have an email address you want to share. We're going to have in the show notes some of those links that you have. But what's the best way for people to find Tom? Uh, well, you know, I'm I'm old enough that I still like email the best. Okay. But I, but I but I look at LinkedIn a fair amount. I can't. I don't make many posts. But if you want to message me on LinkedIn. If you want to send me a bunch of stuff, I'm going to ask you to switch to email anyway. Um, but uh, what's the best email address? Out. What's the best email address? And we'll get it in the show notes. Tom.richards at nicholsonconstruction.com. Excellent. Excellent. Tom, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode number 89, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.